Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 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 Just to let you know that uh, you may be careful and involved in the presidency, the mission plan, all that sort of <coughs> The mission plan was passed by the presidency yesterday. Well, that's the proposals for this presidency of Clyde Valley, Fourth and Clyde Valley. Uh, it's quite a big area it covers, and it's to go around the whole lot from Scotland all the way to the General Assembly next month uh, for their approval and deliberation. So, just to let you know that as part of the process has now started. And lastly, We've got the two young ladies to lead us in worship this morning. <laughs> uh, from my hometown, Craig Newt and Murrow. <laughs> We've got Dennis Paul and myself and these two young ladies. We're doing well for Rob Murrow and Craig Newt. It's uh, Roberta Hutton and Margaret Clarkson. Uh, they are both elders at Craig Newt of Haven Parish Church, a part of uh, Eric's uh, uh, combined church of Rob Murrow and Craig Newt of Haven. So, ladies, we look forward to leading us in worship this morning. They are young ladies, I've got to say, by the way. Thank you for the compliment. We'll pay you later. <laughs> it's uh, very nice to be here this morning, and thank you very much for having us and making us feel so welcome. Our call to worship is from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, O the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful souls. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. The first uh, hymn we're going to sing this morning is a great hymn of praise to the Lord. All people that are left to dwell, CHO number 63. <laughs>
if you would find our true joy and gladness. In you, we are always rich. In you, all gifts are ordered and find their rightful place. In you, we find the joy of giving. In you, we find wholeness and healing. But Father, how quickly we are overawed when others are more rich. We are blinded by the splendour of their homes, the increase of their wealth as their profit margin increases. How quickly we turn to doubt and disbelief, suspicion and misgivings. Or do we turn to greed and try to hoard? We build bigger barns, open them and find it out to hold what we should be sharing. Lord, we confess we can easily become misguided. We can be swayed by greed and selfishness. We can store up reserves in churches when our neighbours can't afford their supper. We covet more and more of that which is not really our own. But in the end, we acknowledge, Father, that it leaves us feeling empty. Lord, we ask for your grace and forgiveness. Fill us with the awareness that all things come from you and that we will be forever restless unless all things find their right place and purpose in you. Fill us with gratitude for the things you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for always hearing our prayers, always being there, extending grace with open arms and giving us what we need to change and order our lives back to you. You have been faithful for thousands of years through all the disruptions and unions, pandemics and plagues, war and skirmishes between nations and between families and friends. You have been faithful to us through it all. And our words could never tell, not even in part of the debt of love that is owed by us. All we can do is say thank you, Lord. All we can do is live our lives as stewards of all that you have given. And in so doing, we hope your name might be praised by our words and deeds. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Master and our Friend. Amen.
some of the other things, you need to have people behind you, these marathon runners. What's them maybe on their own run? They still need something to coach them and something to train them up. And so it's not really a thing that we do on our own. And that's like a lot of activities that we have. We need somebody to help us. A lot of activities that we do, we need people to give us a wee hand. And we tend to do them with people. And we come to church and we're all together in church. Now I've asked Alan, a young, my young assistant, if he'll give me a wee hand this morning to demonstrate this. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put these, these scrunchy things around his four fingers. <laughs>
to right and repeat to the just a yellow station for the top right. I'm not sure how well we know this one. No. But we're all such a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't like the and if you don't like the tune, we need to blame Sheena and the choir for it, because I gave her the choice of two tunes this morning. And she liked this one because it's a wee bit more upbeat and a bit more average. So you can clap your hands to it. It's got it's it's a Caribbean folk tune, <coughs> so the hymn book tells us. And it goes like this. Hands to work and feet to run. God's good gifts to me and you. Hands and feet he gave to us to help each other the whole day through. I find that's quite easy. Do you want to take oh, it? thank you. Do you want to say, see, take just a wee bash thing and do it? And it will do it for you. And it is talking about hands and feet working together, so you might want to put your hands together and make a joyful clap or sound. So with me, together, go. Hands to work and feet to run, God's good gifts to me and you. Hands and feet he gave to us to help each other the whole day through. Done. You're all in the choir. <coughs>
which the more beautiful flags do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honour to those parts that need it. And so there is no division in the body, but all these different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. One part is praised and all the other parts share its happiness. All of you are Christ's body and each one is a part of it. Amen. And we go down this blessing to this week. Thank you for reading this morning. We're now going to sing a different hymn again. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but you'll be very familiar with June. The words are slightly different. It's a John Bell hymn, and we found this hymn recently and have built a service almost around this hymn. There is a line of women, Back to Eve, and the tune is the old chorus, uh, Fishers of Men, is that what it is? When Jesus saw the fish of men in boats upon the sea, I'm sure you'll recognise the tune. Treated as second class citizens 
and where girls are not allowed access to education. In the days of Esther, women were subject to their father or their husband's wishes. They were lord and master. Women had no say in their own lives. Esther had been orphaned at a young age and was raised by her cousin Mordecai, a wise and saintly Torah scholar and a leader among the Jewish people. After King Azura's wife failed to answer his summon, he had her executed as an example to all other noble women in case they got the same idea and decided to disobey their husbands. Like Prince Charming, he sent all his agents all over the land to find him a suitable replacement. Esther tried to avoid being taken. She was Jewish. She wanted to stay amongst her people. But despite hiding, she was found and taken to the palace. Most pictures of Esther, like the one in her screens just now, depict her as a young girl. But she's actually believed to have been a mature woman, over 40, when she was taken to the palace. The king, like the Prince Charming in Cinderella, I see Cinderella, it was Cinderella. The king was displeased with all these potential candidates until Esther was presented. And immediately he was besotted with her and made her his queen. Esther was forced to keep her Jewish ancestry hidden from the king, but she continued to practice her religion in secret. Being vegetarian meant she could eat kosher food, and she had seven different maids so she could keep track of the days of the week and know when the Sabbath was. Although she was ensconced in the palace, her cousin Mordecai still looked out for her and spoke to her in secret at night in the palace garden. Waiting for her one evening, he heard two guards hatch a plot to kill the king. Mordecai told Esther of what he had heard and she reported it to the king and thus the coup was discovered. Esther lived in the palace content with her life until the promotion of a man called Haman to be Prime Minister. He was a known Jew hater and was out to destroy the Jews at the first opportunity. The chance came through Mordecai and Esther's cousin, who refused to bow down to this new Prime Minister. He ordered that Mordecai be hung and all the Jews in the land be killed. Mordecai asked his cousin to intervene on behalf of her Jewish brothers and sisters. Esther agreed to speak to the king, but only if Mordecai and the Jews would fast and pray for three consecutive days. She knew she was entirely at the king's mercy, yet instead of preening or working to amplify her charms to persuade him, she fasted and prayed. Esther knew that it was important to pray as it was to act. God's help is what really matters. With God on her side, even an unadorned and weak woman could sway the mind of the all-powerful monarch. Esther bravely approached the king without prior appointment, which in itself was an act punishable by death. She invited the king and Haman to a private party. At the party, the time was right for Esther to reveal her true identity. And, oh, excuse me, I thought it was Esther coming in. She revealed her true identity to the king and the threat of annihilation of her people. The king was very angry. Haman's order, and he ordered him to be hung. The Haman fell Esther's feet to beg for mercy. He didn't get any. The king was furious. He gifted Esther Haman's mansion, but her mission was not complete. The royal edict.
contradict regarding the Jews who were still in the force. She had to save the people. The king said it could not be revealed, but she wept and begged and allowed her cousin Mordecai to plead with her. As a favour to him for saving his life, the king relented. He instructed them to make legislation, whatever was necessary to save the Jews. He therefore sent out royal decrees to all provinces, declaring that the Jews had the right to defend themselves and kill enemies who rose against them. The robbed and Queen Esther was in the right place to intercede for her people. Mordecai said to her that perhaps it was for this moment that she had been royalty, had been placed there by God to save a nation. Right place at the right time, or God's place at God's time. The Jewish festival Purim is celebrated annually to remember a time when the nation was saved, not by war or armies, but by a woman. A woman who prayed to her Lord and acted. There are more women around in positions of power now than Esther could ever have imagined. But how many of them do you think pray to their God before they make decisions affect many others? Perhaps we should all try to follow Esther's example, to pray and follow God's direction for our lives. We may never be pursued by Prince or Princess Charming, but when God calls, we should be ready to answer his call. And we hear about other Christian women as we sing further <coughs> of the hymn. And we're going to sing three verses of John Dale's song, It Is a Life of Women.
quietly serve God where they are, but are part of God's team and who we can do without. <coughs> Let's think about what Paul says about Phoebe and how that can relate to us and our relationship with God. Paul writes at the end of Romans, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church at Kenya that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper to many, and of myself also. First of all, let's think about her name, Phoebe. Names were important in biblical times, and often biblical writers will emphasize the meaning of someone's name and the way that that can express what their character was like. Paul himself, like Peter, had a name change to signify their change of heart and new life in Jesus. Phoebe's name means radiant or bright, and we're reminded of Jesus' words about letting our light shine, letting our faith and his love shine through us to those around. From what Paul says, Phoebe definitely let her faith and love shine through her because he says she was a helper to many. For Phoebe, this may have taken the form of helping the church in her hometown of Kenya by allowing it to meet in her house or by giving financial support to the church in Corinth, the larger city nearby. Many scholars think that Phoebe took the letter that Paul had written to the Romans and delivered it personally, especially when he said they had to receive her in the Lord, because this means that she was going to Rome. Secondly, Paul describes Phoebe as a sister, and this reminds us that we are all part of the family of God, and as members of that family, we should all look after each other and help each other out especially when members of the family might be in difficulty due to sickness, distress, unemployment, or whatever the situation might be. Thirdly, Paul says that Phoebe is a servant of the church. The word used here in Greek is the word diakonos, from which we get the word deacon, and is the same word used of Paul and Timothy and others in the New Testament. This is the first time the word is used to describe a female, and it leads us to think that Phoebe was a leader and an important person in the early church at Kenya and Corinth, and that women were being given important roles in the church, this new um, organisation. Paul also says that Phoebe was a great helper to Mary and to him. This is borne out by the fact that Phoebe is mentioned first of all the people that Paul lists in his letter. And just like the list of ingredients in a jar of sauce, the first ingredient is always the major one. So Phoebe is a key figure in the early church in her hometown and city. Her help may have surprised many people because there were not many women leaders at this time. But God had given Phoebe the ability to help others and she was faithful in using her gifts to help Paul and work for God. Phoebe was busy doing the work of the Lord in her church. She was not waiting for someone to ask her to do something. She was using her abilities for the work of the Lord. She did not just sit in church or in the, the Christian gathering every Sunday. She knew that being part of the family of God meant giving her time, talents and abilities to serve. We should be like Phoebe, and in the spirit of John F. Kennedy, not ask what the church can do for me, but what can I do for the church? God has given us all gifts, and we are called to be like Phoebe and to serve who God has placed us, whether that's in our families, friendship groups, our workplaces, our church, and our communities. We are to use our talents and gifts and serve him, and let his light of love shine through us to all those around. And I'm sure that you've been blessed in this place by those who've gone before, 
and have served here by letting their light shine. And for those around us today who serve, whether praying faithfully at home because they can't be here in person, or by phoning with words of care and encouragement, by baking for coffee mornings, or making serving soup at lunches, by being elders or property people, by taking care of the plants and the flowers, by looking after the finances, by helping in the Sunday school or creche, by bringing the Bible into the church, by giving others a word of encouragement on a Sunday morning, by giving to the food bank, or supporting Christian aid and fair trade, and so much more. This long list isn't exhaustive and doesn't include all that people do. Like Phoebe, we should continue to serve in whatever way God has given us gifts to serve. And so we finish the trip with a challenge to be like Esther and to be like Phoebe in our walk with God and in our service to his church and people and play our part in God's team. And so we also give thanks for all the Esthers and Phoebes in our midst and who've gone before who quietly served alongside us, sharing their gifts and God's love. And not forget the Timothys and the Phillips as well. Amen. We continue by singing in hymn 252, As a Fire is Made for Burning.
all people are made. We tell now to pray for others and for our world. We pray for all who are hungry or who do not have enough to live with dignity. May they find generosity and inclusion in their Christian communities. God, in your mercy, hear <coughs> our prayers. We pray for all who live in loneliness and isolation. May they have friendship and community. We pray for those who are sick at home or in hospital. May they know healing and wholeness. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. May they know comfort and strength to cope. And we ask you this morning to bless <coughs> David Fisher, Joanne Downey, Sylvia Devine, who is back in hospital, Helen Daly, <coughs> excuse me, Linda Cooper, Mary Beard, Ali Tweedy, Peggy Spears, and the Walker family, <coughs> grant them your strength. God, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. We pray for all who are abused in any way, whose homes or neighbourhoods <coughs> or places of work or study are places of fear, not of safety. May they be strengthened and freed from abusers and fear. May they find you good plans for them and hope in you. God, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray too for all who are shunned, from whom people turn away. Please help them to be included and to know that they are loved by you. God, in, our mercy, in your mercy. Yeah. We also pray for who all have been displaced, who live in exile and in fear of losing everything that they have ever known, or whose lives have been torn apart by war and violence, especially those in Gaza, Israel, Palestine, Ukraine and Sudan. May <coughs> they know your peace and strength in their lives. God, in your mercy, <coughs> we pray for our government and local authority that they would make wise decisions for the benefit of all and that they would be guided by integrity and wisdom. God, in your mercy, in our prayers. We pray for your church, especially our own branch, the Church of Scotland, at this time of huge change, uncertainty and upheaval. May we be assured of your presence and purpose and be a light shining brightly, showing your love and grace. Grow God, in your mercy. Lord, your promise of freedom, forgiveness, inclusion, justice and peace are fulfilled in Jesus. He is a life-giving light which even the deepest darkness cannot extinguish. It is through Jesus that we are able to come close to God and to discern God's plans of hope for us. And it is in his name that we humbly bring our prayers to you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. We'll now have the, uh, the offering, sorry, the offering will be up in the <laughs>
together to dedicate our own gifts. Father God, we come before you in gratitude for the wonder of your great love shown to us. We thank you for all that you have given to us to sustain us, food, homes, the love and companionship of families and friends. We praise you that you sent your son to die for us. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who makes you known to us and sanctifies us and makes us more like Jesus. We thank you that we can come and worship together and we rejoice that you have given each of us gifts to use as members of the body of Christ. Here we present our gifts, the work of our hands, our hearts and our lives and dedicate them to you and your purposes. We ask you to accept these our offerings and pray that they may be used to help to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our world today and always, here and everywhere. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. 